bit of background. Uh, I, like most um, elders in, in Thailand at the moment, somewhat dismayed at the rapid secularization of the society, particularly Bangkok, which in a way is a country in itself and somewhat separate from everywhere else. But nevertheless, um, we're not really seeing a way to re-engage young people. There's so much, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I say is give Buddhism a chance, you know, at least give it half an hour of your time, you know, just because the, the lack of interest and the dismissal of, of Buddhism is uh, really spreading at a remarkable rate amongst young people. Many different causes and conditions for this, some movement to more and more uh, middle class kids in international schools, um, predominantly using English language rather than Thai language, which has a significant effect in my opinion. Plus there's just um, very um, superficial understanding of of religion and it's something I, you know, I've been pushing for to, um, for many years, you may even have heard me say that there's no such thing as religion. You can't just make a general statement that religion is like this and religion is like that and the role of religion in society is this. Um, because it's, it's really important to understand that there are different families or species of religion and the religions that grew up in the Middle East are essentially um, one family or they don't get on with each other very well as you know um, but they all share the same idea of what a religion is. They're sort of more or less the same structure and that can be summarized as belief systems. So this is the idea of a religion as essentially a belief system. Um, belief in dogmas and this can be verify, I think, very simply by the fact that these days the word religion and the word faith are used in interchangeably. We can say the Christian faith or the Christian religion and mean the same thing, which points very clearly to the centrality of faith. The religions that grew up in India, most particularly Buddhism, is of a different species of religion, and I would characterize it as an education system. So it's so I'm, I'm proposing this division of religions um, as in the major religions of the world as belief system religions and education system religions. And you cannot understand um, a education system religion through the lens of a belief system religion. So if you're a Buddhist, you may be you know, a Christian will say, oh, you're a, you're, you're a Christian. What, you're a Buddhist, what do you believe in? First question, okay? Uh, because the assumption is that's what religion is. You know, they believe in Jesus, you believe in Buddha. And if they're a, uh, very uh, extreme or fundamental, then they'll, they'll draw a very um, grim conclusion from that. But if they're more liberal, then they'll say, oh yeah, same thing, different words, different language, you know, we're all. Um, but but this, this idea that there, the template, the, the belief system religion template is the template from which all religions are to be understood is one of the fundamental um, mistakes I think that people make. Um, and then seeing a, a belief, a, excuse me, an education system religion through a belief system lens means that people tend to take like one teaching which seems to kind of represent the way in which it's different from other religions, let's say rebirth. They say, oh, you're a, you believe in rebirth. You know, so that's your, that's your kind of, you know, standard belief system as a Buddhist. You're a, you're a reincarnation believer. And this, um, this superficial and inaccurate way of looking at, at Buddhism has spread throughout the world through the prestige of Western values and culture, both in the more formal means of education establishments, but also through internet, social media. So young people today 
you know, um, adopt many of the criticisms of monotheistic religions that they find um, in, the, in the blogs and, and, and social media of young people in the West and just apply them blindly to Buddhism. So as a Westerner coming to Buddhism, and one of the things finding the, the love, my love for Buddhism is in so many ways it seems to avoid the pitfalls of monotheistic religions and those things that I rejected in monotheistic religions not present in, in Buddhism and that's something that really inspires me. And yet seeing people accusing, uh, you're talking about religion, about Buddhism as if it shared all of those features of monotheistic religion is just such a sad thing. So it's a sad thing, but there is hope because I say just open Wikipedia, just spend half an hour. Is that, you know, um, the, one of the analogies I give, I don't know whether this will be as clear to you as Thai people, it's like somebody saying, yeah, I don't like Chiang Mai. You say, well, why don't you like Chiang Mai? So, well, I, I don't like islands. You know, islands really bore me. I, I, I never really wanted to go to an island. And, and, and I, I don't want to go to Chiang Mai because I like mountains. You know, I don't want to go to like a really flat, uh, featureless island, you know. I, uh, and, and so what do you conclude from that? If you've been to Thailand or you're Thai, you know, this person doesn't know Chiang Mai. He's never been to Chiang Mai. He hasn't even bothered to look it up on a map, you know. All he's heard is the name, and and this is what we're we're finding in, and and w I have parents come to me and, and say, Tanjan, my son came home from school today and said he's not a Buddhist anymore; he's an atheist. And <laughs> just think about it, yeah, and, uh, um, yeah. So um, anyway, so I'm 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 concerned and and. and, and reflecting on this and a way of re-engaging young people and it's not going to come through conventional means of, and like giving Dhamma talks in monasteries or, or even yeah I, I, I have a presence online and and in and on TV and radio and all, all that so I'm quite prominent as a public speaker but I, I can't say that uh, you know it's having a, a you know it's it's a a kind of a starfish kind of um, accomplishment. So, um, and I often thought about trying to to create a kind of a drama or something that would engage people emotionally, because that's that's where you you draw people in emotionally and and prepare them to be in a space in which they can hear these teachings. Because unless you do the groundwork and people are emotionally ready and interested, it'll just go in one ear and out the other, you know, which is probably one of the few forms of emptiness that uh, modern Buddhists are familiar with. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you for being here, Tana John. Um, I know how lucky I am to have Clear Mountain right here in my city where I live, and um, just getting to be around monastics for the last few years has been life-changing. And I was wondering if you would be willing to share something about what you love most about being a monastic <laughs> or about monastic life. Well, it's like it, for me, it's like one and the same thing. So it's saying, what do you love about your life? Because I can't imagine, you know, like a non-monastic life. Um, I guess the first thing, I, as as a teenager, I I, I grew up in a um, in a rural town, and and feeling very alienated from from the people around me and not fitting in and and um, a great pull to India is the main, main thing. And also this, this search for a peer group. And at that time, this is mid-70s, um, I thought that, that of all the different groups of people that I could see that might be a peer group with the hippies. Yeah. So I did this overland 
uh, hitchhiking mostly all the way from from England to India and and um, and hanging out with a lot of hippies and being really disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> one memory in in uh, Goa was the place where everybody used to hang out. For, I didn't stay there very long. And you, they would have these um, like grass roof cafes on the beach and um, people would bring cassette tapes from from the west so you, you know you'd be walking along and there'd be let it bleed and dark side of the moon and things like this as you're walking along this this uh, beach and and um, and you go into the I, I remember just one day going to this restaurant and sat down and you had these like um, call it like costume hippies. So different kinds of hippies, a costume hippie, and they're usually French or Italian, and they, you know, they're so, you know, I'm just so jealous, you know, because they had it all down. You have a certain kind of, of like, doti, and you have a certain kind of knobbly walking stick, um, and you have a certain kind of jacket, a certain kind of beads, henna here, a certain here, a certain length of hair, and it's just, for me, it was just so cool, and I, I just couldn't do that, you know, it's like, um, <laughs> so 18, 17 years old, 18 years old, and a uh, certain kind of chillum that had to come from a certain place in Mysore with certain kinds of, yeah, it's, this, it's a kind of a whole thing, you know, and I, and I, and I was sitting in one of these, um, one of these restaurants with a number of these, and this costume hippie, um, he lifted up his, his incredible, knobbly walking stick. He said, Baba, Baba, I ordered my French fries 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and, <laughs> where were you? and I thought, I could just be back in London. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I thought, this is not a peer group that I want to be identified with. Uh, <laughs> So that, that was that disappointment. So, yeah, so the, 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 what I'm trying to say is like a peer group, finding a group of people who have same ideals, um, same aspirations, same commitment to a moral and ethical life. Um, and I mean, that's, that's a treasure, isn't it? Where, where can you find that? And, and having friends you know, not just one or two or three friends in your life that you know you could bet your life on them, that kind of loyalty and goodness, but so many, you know, literally many, the majority of monks, you know, you, you would die for each other, you would, you know, you put your, uh, your integrity is more important than than your personal comfort or even your personal safety. And this is kind of normal in a monastic order. It's not everyone, you know, there are, there are, of course, there are bad monks and, and uh, indulgent monks and pr proud monks and conceited, yes. But as, in terms of percentage or the, the majority of monks, you think, I wouldn't want to live with any other group of human beings, for sure. So that was one of like the in immediate fruits of the holy life, you know, just just the sense of good friendship and how wonderful that is. And and you may remember where, where this famous uh, case where Ananda says, "Oh, the, the good friendship is half of the holy life," and, and the Buddha says, "No, it's, it's the whole thing." I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't need to practice sila and samadhi and banya, you have good friends and that's it. It means that without that, you know, without that one factor, you're not going to get very far. That's why it's, it's like a complex machine, you know, you could have just one small cog or one small thing that if that, w if that didn't work, then the whole computer or the whole thing wouldn't work. And the holy life without good friendship, no matter all the other elements in place and a great teacher and so on, then not necessarily going to progress on the on the holy life. So for me, uh, um, for most monks, it's not so easy when you begin. And one of the reasons is that um, there is no lifetime, particularly in Thai Buddhism, there's no lifetime commitment. You can leave at any time. 
and also you can leave extremely easily. There's no, usually it's done in a, in a beautiful way with a ceremony, but strictly speaking, it's not necessary. If I wanted to leave the monkhood right now, all I'd have to do is to speak to one person and say, that's it, I had enough, I'm not a monk anymore. And I would no longer be a monk. It's that easy. So, given that it's that easy, and, and in forest monasteries, you know, really um, don't try to use all those kind of psychological trips to, tricks to keep you on board and to, um, and, and to maintain control over people. You really do realize you have that autonomy. If this is too tough, you leave. And certainly as a monk, I, uh, as an abbot of a monastery, I, I don't want miserable monks, you know? If you don't want to be here, go away, you know? Um, um, because it just spoils it for everyone else, basically. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you can, uh, of course, you say everyone goes through a hard time and you support them through that. So that I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. But um, really, as a monk, you have to recommit every day of your life because it's so easy to, to leave. It's not like, oh, okay, now I make a lifetime vow and that's it. Although you may do that privately, but that's not like institutionalized. Um, so many, so f a problem for many young monks particularly is you, you, you reach some kind of challenge and difficulty and you've got so much energy, but it, it, it goes into two. It's like one part of your en energy and effort and intelligence is how am I going to get through this? And the other part of your brain is saying, maybe I don't want to. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I just go back to lay life and have an organic farm and, and um, you know, do good things in the world. And, and you, so monks can create incredibly um, realistic fantasies about, you know, um, a perfect lay life, you know, when they when they start to have doubts in their, in their monasticism. So I, I do um, recommend say, okay, if you're going to do this, and so we give people a period wearing white and as novice, like a year or more. You know, if you're really going to do this, my recommendation, it's not compulsory, is to make a five-year commitment, and at the end of those five years, review and see whether you're really cut out for this, um, but you can't be reviewing every day of your life. It's just a misery. So where was I going? So me, yeah, we're talking about me. So me, I, I'm kind of like um, a little bit of an outlier, and it's like uh, took to it like a fish to water. I just, you know, never wanted to do anything else ever, you know, <laughs> just from the moment um, I walked into... Ajahn Chah's monastery, and and I said, and and to this day, I think there is nothing that, as a monk, I can't do that I want to do, and there's nothing that I want to do that I can't do. So that's that. That's why I feel very happy with my my choice of life. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go on about myself too much. We can uh, talk about. It. I have a question. Uh, I'm pretty new to the Buddhism and uh, new practitioner, and I definitely do find a lot of challenges. I wanted to hear, when you started practicing, what was your biggest challenge? And if you, let's say, get a chance to go back to the time and tell the younger self some advice, like what one thing you'd say to yourself that might make a difference? So I didn't hear that. Um, sorry. What would I? Oh, if I was to go back, that, uh, what would I tell my younger self? I said, "You're probably freaking out now, seeing you 50 years later, <laughs> <laughs> talking to you. You know, um, just calm down. I've come to give you some advice. You know, it's probably the first thing I said." <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I, I mean, the, you know, uh, same as everyone. You have the hindrances and defilements, and uh, I mean, I didn't. I did have very strong faith, um, patience, and love of the Dhamma, and love 
um, I can say, an incredible faith in my teacher, and that was probably more important than anything else because it's not really the intellectual understanding that sees you through the difficult times. It's this sense that this is worth it. Um, stick it out. There is there is value in this. But I think if you, if you look in your life, you know, we're, some people are more patient than others, but even every individual, we can see that our levels of patience uh, are not constant in every area of our life. There are some areas where we can be very patient and other areas impatient. And that's an interesting topic to, to investigate. And, and I would say the areas, uh, at least in which I've been most patient, are those in which I see meaning and value in it. You know, if there's a point, well, yeah, I could do that. I can. S I'm. I'm quite tough. I could put up with that. I'm quite. But why? What? <laughs> what for? And that. That's what undermines patience, isn't it? And so, conversely, what uh, underlies patience is when you clearly see it's worth it. It's. It's tough. Yeah, just stick with it, and you'll come out the other side. And you have some. You have examples of people who've been through this and come out the other side. And with Ajahn Chah, he, he would almost never talk about his, um, his strengths and his accomplishments, you know, and almost, I, uh, when I was writing his, researching the original Thai biography, you know, going through every single uh, audio tape and trying to find biographical information, and you know, it's like slim pickings, really, you know, like uh, hundreds of hours, and just, you find a sentence when he talks about himself, and it's like a treasure. You know, so, um, but when he did talk to, to the Sangha, then he would talk about his failings and his difficulties, um, and, and he would say, look, when I, started, when I started off, I was no different from all of you. You know, I had all the same problems, the same lust and anger and, and all these things. The only thing <laughs> that made me any different from you is I never gave up. That's my chief spiritual <laughs> achievement, I never gave up, I just kept going. And so as a young monk, you know, you're already inclined to put your teacher on a pedestal, and it's so wonderful, and the more you put your teacher on a pedestal, then the more you feel, little old, I'm just so hopeless, I'll never be like my teacher, you know, and he's so wonderful. Um, and so Ajahn Chah is very s skillful, you know, he wouldn't let you do that, you know, he's saying, look, I am where I am now, not because of some special being, but because I've put the work in. And if you put the work in, then you can do this too. So it was incredibly empowering. So, yeah, to begin with, it's um, physically, it's going to northeast Thailand, the, uh, the climate, particularly at Wat Nanachat, it's a miserable climate. I hate it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's only kind of, you know, the only time, there's probably a month of the year, you know, you can turn to somebody and say, oh, a nice day today, <laughs> you know. <it's> like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a month out of the year. Um, and it's hot, but it not only is it hot, it's sticky. And um, as a child, I had asthma throughout my childhood. And so I have this, I'm not exactly traumatized, but I'm very sensitive to like stuffiness and stickiness and, and, and lack of, of ventilation. And it's kind of very, more, probably more than most people. So I chose to live like 20 years in this environment where like in the hot season, you feel like you're swimming through the air, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's that thick, you know. <laughs> it's like the Dead Sea, you could lay back and it would sort of hold you up. So. <laughs> so that was that was uh, the, like the physically, and and of course, uh, we, you know, get up really early in the morning, three before three in the morning, and ten or eleven before you get to night. So, you, um, eating one meal a day, and sometimes working really hard, really hard physical work on one meal a day. And we didn't have all the tonics and things that we have these days. You know, we could get a, like a hot drink, sweet drink once a week, you know, he was saying it was a real treat. You know, so this is a kind of a good old days kind of thing. You know, in my day, you know, they, they, they don't know they're even born. <laughs> if, you know, they're this younger whippersnappers, you know, 
they've got it made, they don't appreciate just what we went through. <laughs> yeah, so I won't, I won't inflict that on you. No, but it, it was pretty, uh, pretty harsh and pretty hard. So that we didn't have electricity, and so there were no and no fans and no um, no relief that way. And when we do these we do this evening sittings in the sala, which is a corrugated iron roof, and you have to wear your robes, and and it was if anything is going to put you off meditation for life, it would be an evening sitting in the sala at Wat Nanachat in those days, because it's so sticky and hot. Within five or ten minutes, you can start to feel your your angsa is starting to get wet. And now your jiwan's wet, and it's just you can just feel the sweat all through your body. And as you sweat in this evening, the mosquitoes <laughs> start. So you're hot and you're sweaty, and you and it's like <sighs> for so meditation is just gritting your teeth and getting through till the you know, the hours up, and then you can go back to your kuti under your mosquito net and really meditate. That was kind of <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but I loved it all the same. I hated it, but I loved it. You know, and, and, and Ajahn Chah used to say it's a bit like, you know, if you eat really spicy food, you know, it's like there's tears coming down. It's like, ah, oh, so it's great, you know. It's like <laughs> so spicy, you know. It's like chicken wing going, ah, oh. um, and it's like that, you know. It's like, yeah, it's tough, but you know, you wouldn't want to do anything else, and um, and it gets easier, of course. And, Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Ajahn, for coming to Seattle. And uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to ask this question. Sure. Uh, in monastics such as you, there are two main qualities that seem to uh, manifest. One is an almost infinite compassion and kindness in everything that you do, and also an incredible discipline to uphold the precepts, the vinayas. Uh, it's almost you have to be super tough inside. Anything you'd like to share that will help we lay people emulate you? Yeah, I mean, it's not quite so heroic as that. I mean, it's like this everyday life and, and, you know, you don't always, you have aspirations, but you don't want to, you know, no one's compassionate 24 hours a day and in every situation. I mean, that's the, the goal to, to move towards. But this idea of a, um, a, a compass and, and moving towards that and, and keep coming back to that is really important. And the Buddha, uh, excuse me, the um, Ajahn Chah used to have a, a, a saying that we repeat both to the to the monks and to the lay people is, if you look after your precepts, your precepts will look after you. And when you see that clearly, then you know it, it changes your. You realize just um, how much you owe to your to your precepts and how much you, you, you cherish them and treasure them. So it's not like, I can't do this and I can't do that. You know, you're right like this in this cage of, of precepts and preventing you from being your real self or something like that. You know, it's, it's just giving you real tools of clarity and mindfulness about your actions and speech um, in a, with a precision that you wouldn't be able to attain without that kind of structure. We believe. Uh, again, the precepts, the, the monastic precepts, um, are, are not kind of cut and dried. You know, there there is room for for discrimination and for judgment. Um, and I, I told this sto story a few days ago. I'll repeat it now. Is is that I'm going to tell you my least favorite Zen story. Okay. Um, and then my least favorite Zen story, uh, you, you will have heard it, and you'll probably say, why is that his least favorite Zen? That's one of my favorites. So I'm going to tell you why as well. Um, 
So this story is about these two monks, and this one's called Kovilo, one's called Nisipo. <laughs> um, oh, we, we, we'll leave them, they're in the second act. So the first act, this is the story first, okay. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, so these two Zen monks are walking through the countryside, and there's a young woman standing by the side of a river, and she says, oh, help me, help me, I'm all alone, it's getting dark, and I need to cross this river, and, and uh, one of the monks is looking a bit, and then the other monk picks her up, and carries her across the water, and puts her down, and they carry on their way. And the monk who's carried her across Notice the other one kind of stiff and he hasn't spoken for an hour or two. He says, you know, he's angry with me. Anything wrong? Um, how could you do that? How could you, ca don't you know we're not allowed to do that? Carry that woman across the water. And so this is the punchline. Yeah, I just carried her for a few seconds across the river and you're still carrying her now. Ah. So... Okay, who likes that story? Who thinks that's a good story? <laughs> okay, now I'm going to tell you why I don't. Let's see if you change your mind. So, <laughs> um, why I don't like this story is because it creates a false dichotomy, a fal uh, false choice. The idea is there are two possibilities. One is you keep your rules and act like this kind of hard-hearted, lump of stone who doesn't care about what happens to young women abandoned by the side of lonely, lonely rivers in the middle of the night, or <laughs> you can just put these rules aside for a while and let compassion take over and carry her over and just let go of that afterwards and dwell in emptiness and something like that. Um, so I don't... I don't think that's really um, the case. So now we're back to venerable. <laughs> so they're, they're walking along on Tudong, and uh, then they come to this lonely river, and they see Wanida, and she's standing there and said, Tanajan, help me. I'm all alone. It's getting cold and dark and I don't know anybody, help me. And, and so what would Ajahn Kovilo and Ajahn, I don't think they pick up Wanida and carry her over the river. They would say, Wanida, there's a village a couple of kilometers back, we'll take you back and we'll, we'll, find, we'll ask someone to put you up for the night. Or we can say, if you're really, if it's a really, uh, you have to get over this evening, then we'll, we'll take a detour. There's a bridge about two or three kilometers up this way, and we'll go around that way, and a bit longer, but we, we don't mind that. We can take you. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so rather than accepting this kind of stereotypical idea of, of rules that sort of just kind of... Um, uh, repress your humanity and, and, and just uh, adapt to this kind of heartless um, uh, sort of framework of what you should do as a monk and what you shouldn't do as a monk and that the alternative to that is to be kind and compassionate and not take these rules so seriously. Um, the, this view is you have these rules, these are your life, these are your, uh, your culture, these are the things that you've been given to by, you know, your father, the, the Buddha. These are the things you uphold. Your integrity lies in keeping these rules. So you think, how can I help Wanida? How can I help this poor young woman without breaking my rules? And then you start thinking, you use your intelligence. Oh, well, then we can take her back to that village, take her to a uh, we can take her to a, a bridge, or we can say, Wanida, get out your phone and call it Uber. <laughs> you know, there, there are just so many more possibilities than, than this story. So, okay, who still thinks this is a good story? 
Thank you. I, I feel that, yeah. Hi, Joan. I've been trying to do death contemplation. When I think about that, it's just kind of a, a blank reaction. Like, yeah, I might die. Um, no, that's of, wrong. You, you will <laughs> die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got started off on the wrong foot altogether already. <laughs> okay, carry on. <laughs> so I, I might die on the way to the car, and, and uh, uh, but but there's um, it's kind of like and then you wait for the emotions to come in, and it's just like okay, well, I'll, I'll try again. I might die by the time I get to the car, and then. And the so it doesn't really penetrate. So I'm wondering how to how do we actually get the alarm bells ringing, you know, yeah. just like all the time. Um, <coughs> yeah. So so we can we can divide meditations into two two groups in one way. One is talking about discursive meditations and non-discursive meditation. So like breathing is a non-discursive meditation. You don't have to use your thinking mind at all. But sometimes, you know, especially if you lead a busy life and you come to meditate in the evening, there's just this momentum of thinking. And it's just so hard to switch mode into a non-discursive object like the breath. And um, so sometimes to begin your meditation session with a discursive object is just taking that thinking energy and, and saying, you can think but think within these boundaries. Think on this particular topic. So you're giving your mind a little bit more space, a little bit more room, a little bit more freedom, but you need to have uh, a strategy and to write down the particular um, progression of reflections on death. Is, uh, so there's things like everybody dies, everybody who's ever lived in the world uh, everybody who's living here now, everybody who will be born, everybody will die without exception. Uh, young, there are young people, old people die, young people die, babies die. And so you are, as long as you're on that particular theme, you can think about it. Memories, things you've seen in movies or in, in, in uh, documentaries on the news and history and things you've read. As long as it, the, the, so it's not one pointed uh, on a sensation or on a w on a word, but you're allowing that little bit of freedom to think, but it has to be on that particular topic that everybody dies. Um, and then, uh, but nobody knows exactly when they will die, so the uncertainty of death. And, and if you have some good examples from people you know or things you've read about, as this suddenly out of the blue kind of death, that's good. So you have people that look steady, kind of decline deaths, unusually rapid deaths, and, and so on. So you're thinking about the uncertainty of the time of death. Another point would be the uncertainty of the kind of death, where, whether it's from some internal disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, or from an accident, or from, uh, from whatever. And then this, I too will die. So that's the culminating one. But this is not like a quick fix. You know, it's not like just, oh, I'm going to die. You know, I might have a car crash on the way home and I'm going to die. Suddenly, you know, this is going to click. It's hard work. You have to just keep going on to it again and again and again and again um, until you develop a certain power of contemplation. And then, and then it can happen. You can start to, to observe some, some changes taking place. Um, and Two, two things. One is there's a certain kind of emotion, um, a kind of sober sadness that can arise from this contemplation. And when you see that emotion arising, you focus on that. But the other um, thing that will often happen with these discursive emo uh, um, uh, contemplations is after a time your mind just says I had enough I don't want to think anymore um, and there's a there's a kind of sense of weariness with thinking and that's when you're you're ripe for breathing meditation or a, um, a non-discursive object so in other words these dis discursive meditations such as a death meditation 
are very good to develop just as a tool in your toolbox. It's no, it's not a, like your main meditation, but it's a good thing to have if you find it getting a bit lazy and, and, and um, neglectful. It's a good one to bring up a sense of urgency. If you're in a meditation retreat or in a monastery or you're, you're having like a whole day or like extended periods to meditate, it's good to have a little, to change things up every now and again, not to get stale. And that's one of the things you can just introduce to freshen stuff up, freshen things up. And then as a prelude to the non-discursive meditations, um, either to create um, a, a particular wholesome emotion, which can then be your object of meditation, which arises as a result of that contemplation, or simply that sense of weariness with thinking that arises even with a, a directed and disciplined kind of discursive meditation. In other words, uh, it will give you a ripeness and a readiness to go into the non-discursive meditation. Thank you, Tanajan. <laughs>